models. Okay, so Justin models past, present, future. Uh, I have like I've been working on models in T C thirty nine for a while. Uh, I am working at the Gallia, and we've been doing this together with Bloomberg. And well, uh, working in thirty nine means like design the future of JavaScript. But let's take a very big step back, and welcome to your history class. So. Models in JavaScript have not always been like this. They were a pretty new thing. Like many years ago, we used to do this. Just stick a script tag in our code that loads some code and that attaches some new variables in the global scope. And we didn't really need modules. Like we didn't have many, like many files, just applications were small. So it was like just a little bit of interactivity. And like this was perfectly fine. And until when it was not fine anymore. And Specifically for server-side JavaScript, applications start to become mo more and more complex. And in 2009, uh, like a group of people decided to work on what is now known as CommonJS. Uh, and fun fact, it was usually called server.js because this problem was only on the server and not on the client. Uh, there was a need for a standard way to load module, to load other files, to load other code, uh, namespacing them without just sticking everything in global scope to avoid like conflicts. And for those who don't know how CommonJS looks like, we have this required function which uh, like loads a file and returns some object. And to export values from our modules, we have this exports object to which we just assign vari vari variables. And when we will import this object, the requir this, this module, the required function, we return the exports object of this module. And that's doesn't just work as is because requiring exports is not really like something defined in like in the browser or in a, in a JavaScript standard. So there is a wrapper function uh, that provides us with these required exports and like modules and other CommonJS specific utilities. And we all now know CommonJS for modules, mostly for non-JS modules. But CommonJS was not that. It was an effort to like create some uh, set of built-ins shared by all the server-side environments that you could readily use. It's similar to what is now Winter CG. Uh, like I've, I've seen there is a breakout session on this day about that. So that's like I was not there in CommonJS day, but it feels something very similar to what, we, what other people are doing now. And what we now refer to CommonJS was actually called CommonJS Modules 1.1, where there was 1.0, and the 1.1 is what, the, what we have now. Uh, it only defined the interface so that there is this requirement as exports object, not how models are loaded. And this has been implemented by many server side environments, such as Node.js. And CommonJS was great, and many people have been using it for many years. But it has a problem. It said require is a synchronous function, and so it doesn't really work in browsers because you don't want the main thread to synchronously wait while your file is being, is being loaded on the from the network. So people working this common in this CommonJS group came up with something which was called CommonJS modules slash asynchronous definition, which was a way to pre-declare all the dependencies that we needed to, to, to run our code so that they could be first loaded uh, asynchronously, and then once everything is ready, we could execute uh, our main code. And this is better known as AMD, uh, which came just one year after CommonJS. And well, it has this define function where we can list the, all the, the imports and utilities you want, uh, such as requirement exports, if you want to use a common just like interface, and beta is an example of an external module that will be loaded somehow and will be uh, like available when we later synchronously execute our code. And like you can see, this is very similar to common JS. It's mostly a wrapper, or there are other ways to use this that are like less similar to common JS. And it had some other uh, differences from CommonJS, such as an asynchronous require function, because not, it's not always possible to statically declare everything that we, we will need. So this require function like allowed like to, to load things from the network later. And AMD supported plugins. Uh, and this allowed creating custom models type, uh, customizing how models are resolved. And it uses that like plugin name, uh, exclamation mark syntax that maybe our people know for Webpack. Uh, I think Webpack inherited the syntax from AMD. And CommonJS AMD, and after five years, 
uh, since MD was released, we finally had some a standard way of defining modules that was supposed to work the same across all the environments, so on the server or on the browsers and everywhere else we can run JavaScript. It has this syntax uh, that, well, like many of us work on JavaScript, so I'm sure many of us already saw this export and import statements. And it has some uh, advantages that share with MD and some with CommonJS. Uh, it is statically analyzable, so exactly as in MD, the, the runtime can preload all the dependencies we'll need, and then later, once everything has been asynchronously loaded, it can start synchronously executing the code. Uh, however, it has a minimal syntactic overhead. We don't have to like define this wrapper function and list in this like somewhere at the top of the file all of our dependencies. We can just use import statements that are very like conceptually similar to the required functions that we have in CommonJS. And ESM supported both named and default exports uh, without uh, reusing uh, the like the same object is there a default export or the namespace, which is what both AMD and CommonJS did. And it took very long time to, to, to define how CommonScript models should work. And by very long time, I mean that in 1999, people already started to think how, uh, like TCR9 was already started to think, how could we standardize models in JavaScript? How would they look like? And there's been like different iterations, uh, some more similar to CommonJS, others more different. Uh, like at some point, it started as syntaxis sugar on top of what was CommonJS. And like there have been ideas for modules for in scopes, uh, import statements were at some point proposed to be very different from what we have now. This looks more like Python than what we have in JavaScript. And like there were like discussions about how to customize loading modules, what are like the different stages for loading modules, and so on. And four years later, uh, CommonJS, uh, well, ESM gained a feature that both CommonJS and MD already provided since the beginning, which is how can we load a module that we cannot start with declare? And dynamic imports were introduced. They're very similar to the asynchronous required function that MD had. Uh, we load something, and then when it's ready, uh, this API was promise based and callback based, but like it's conceptually the same. And a couple of years later, ECMAScript modules also got top level await, so that we don't have, like, we can, for example, use this dynamic import syntax at the top level of a module without worrying about callbacks. And that's what we have now. Uh, what we ha that's how we arrive to what we have now. Uh, but like, is there, what the situation of models today? Uh, well, models are being used in productions and as a distribution format. Uh, common JSON India is still very popular, uh, like NPM, uh, the like JavaScript, most of JavaScript models in NPM are still written or are still published in common JS. Most people write ESM uh, in, their, in their editor, but then they compile it to CommonJS or to something else. Because CommonJS still, still works better with Node ecosystem in, in, in most cases. And it's, there is no clear migration path for libraries written uh, with one model system to, uh, with an older model system to ECMAScript models. Uh, because, like, yes, you can just rewrite your code, but then not all the, fun the functionality is there. Uh, it might be harder for your consumer to import your libraries, and like there are different problems. Uh, an example of something that's missing from these models and that CommonJS provides is a way to synchronous import dependencies, not at the beginning. Uh, like maybe we have some file that is very heavy to import. It does some heavy computation, or like we just want to defer doing necessary work unless it's like really necessary. Uh, with CommonJS, we can just use this require function wherever we want, uh, such as inside another function. And this heavy computation pie will only be loaded if we actually call the circ function. Economic models don't let us do anything like this. Uh, another example is that EMD supported writing multiple models in a file. Bundling EMD models was very easy. It was mostly just concatenating all of the individual models, and then the, the runtime the EMD loader would like link them together. And with ESM, uh, we cannot really concatenate all the models in a single file because we have to uh, be careful about scope, about how to level await interacts uh, with other models, about how do we verify the model namespace objects if you use the like import star syntax. So it's not as easy as it was before. And also, I showed before that MD supported a way to customize model loading to define your, your own module types. 
and ESM doesn't really have something like that. And also, the integration story for the languages in ESM is still not as good as it could be. And so ESM I is great, people are using it, uh, but there are still problems. And within this 9 there is this effort that we call modules harmony. Uh, harmony is a, like an overloaded word in series 9 It was already used for like what is then called ES6. Uh, it's nice. It means that everything will at some point play well together. And okay, these slides were actually not for 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 today. Like uh, so, I'm not, like I assume most of you have already heard of series 9 uh, but like it's the JavaScript committee that defined how JavaScript should work. And we've been talking, we have these recurring meetings every two months, and we've been talking about modules harmony like at every single meeting for the past year at least. Like you can see March, July, September, and then also like in all the subsequent meetings, there were always modules topic. Like the people working models were uh, pushing this, <laughs> and like everything will, everyone was always forced to focus on modules at every single meeting. It was actually nice. And we've been discussing about how the different proposals related to modules can work together, how can we be like harmonious together, how can we create a coherent story around them, and how can we decide what to ship, what to not ship, uh, like in which order the different like features, the different missing functionality should be added, and so on. So we have this, like we've been talking about this, but like what is this in practice? Uh, there are well, maybe, because they're still old proposals. So things might change, things might get standardized, things might, we might decide that something is a very bad idea and end up not doing it. So we have been talking about six main proposals. Uh, the division in proposals is not always clear in this model space because there are like, the, the space is so big that we often find ways to refine the proposals division. Some proposals get maybe get closer or some proposals get split in different functionalities. And like this is a good way to think about what we're doing now. Uh, don't, you don't need to read all of them now because we're going through all the proposals one by one. Okay, uh, so the first one I want to highlight is uh, import attributes. It's a stage three with an asterisk, but we can say it's stage three. Uh, import attributes uh, gives us a way to pass some parameter to the underlying module loader. So when a JavaScript developer writes this import statement, uh, importing uh, like the math.js module, uh, the JavaScript engine uh, asks to the runtime uh, to load this module. What does this JavaScript engine ask to someone else mean? Uh, so by the JavaScript engine, I mean things like SpiderMonkey or V8. Uh, they only implement the like main ECMAXIP standard. They don't have I.O. capabilities, and they rely on some other wrapper to communicate with the, with the outside world. And this other wrapper is usually a browser. It can be something like Node.js or Dino, or like all the, uh, all the different JavaScript runtimes that you might have heard about. And like I'm keeping this division between the two because uh, like the, the, the JavaScript engine is what works the same across across like all the places around JavaScript, while the wrapper capabilities can change. So when the JavaScript runtime, when the JavaScript engine asks to the to the wrapper runtime to load something, the wrapper runtime will, for example, uh, do a fetch request to a server or load a file from the network after resolving the like the import specifier to a URL or to a file path. Then the server will reply with some code, uh, like it's basically a string. And the runtime knows that it's a JavaScript string, so it gives to the JavaScript engine uh, the instructions how to execute that file. So it says there are these exports, you can execute it using this function, uh, that this function will then just be the, the JavaScript engine evaluation function. And, and so. So what if we want to integrate our to like integrate our model system with something else? Uh, the JavaScript engine is not about JavaScript, but we might want to load, for example, CSS modules. Uh, and we cannot really define what CSS is within the JavaScript specification. So import attributes are a way for the developer to just tell to the JavaScript engine to forward some, some information, uh, such as type CSS the browser will see that he has to load this module with this uh, like type CSS attribute. So it n the browser knows what type CSS means. So it can load a style sheet. Uh, right now, 
uh, all modules are loaded the same way, uh, but like we made, like we've designed now things so that the browser can tell to the server, hey, I want a stylesheet module, hey, I want a JavaScript module. And the server will then reply with some code. Uh, it has, at least on the web, uh, the, the, the JavaScript, the, the wrapper runtime will check that the MIME type of the requested module matches what the user wanted. So type CSS is, is correct. So the import process proceeds. And the, the runtime wrapper then gives the JavaScript engine some response, abstracting away the fact that this is a module. So at exactly the same as it did for JavaScript modules, it just defines the interface and how to evaluate this module. And so this allows all wrapper runtimes to integrate whatever language they want in an opaque way that the JavaScript uh, engine doesn't need to, to, know, like, to know about. And there is a big warning regarding this proposal, uh, which is you've likely already heard about something called import assertions, which was a previous version of the proposal that allowed just very fine that a lot of module had some properties uh, and it used the assert keyword because like it was uh, like just failing the process if the module didn't have some properties defined somewhere else. Uh, while integrating this uh, with HTML, uh, it came up that those was not the, the, the expected semantics. And so the proposal has been updated to be something more generic, uh, like import attributes that are not just assertions, can actually affect how a model is loaded and what a model is. Uh, second proposal, uh, I think this is stage three now. Uh, okay, still stage two, uh, source phase imports. Uh, stage two means that uh, like we are still refining how the proposal how the proposal should be done and it's not implementation ready yet so like things may change uh, before looking at what the proposal is exactly uh, let's take a look at how modules are loaded uh, so we have our module uh, who's like let's assume we're on the web so modules have an URL uh, we have this x.com slash main.js module uh, and this module has a global object has its own URL and it imports uh, other dependencies, such as this dot slash mod dot js. Uh, so how does this import work? First, the, the module that we want to load has to be resolved. So we have to, to compute the full URL of the module we're loading. Uh, once <coughs> it's resolved, we can, like the, the wrapper runtime can fetch, or like fetch and compile uh, the, the module. Then we attach some context to this module, such as the global environment in which it must be, ex it must be executed, its uh, URL, so that when we can like, use this new URL to load its recursive dependencies. And then we link all the modules with all their dependencies together. And this is like a recursive process because we have to walk the whole module graph, making sure that everything is loaded, everything has its own uh, execution context, everything has its own URL where we can load transit dependencies from. And after everything's linked, so our, our models graph is ready, we can finally evaluate all the models in the correct order, depending on like, how different dependencies between, between all the models are defined. And what this proposal does is to basically expose the module at an early phase. So the mo important module would not go through this, this whole pipeline to these five steps. It would just stop earlier. Uh, specifically, it would stop after fetching and compiling the module. And the syntax look at this. So we say we only want to import the source of uh, mode and not to, to do the full process using the source keyword. And we get back an object well, representing this source. And why are we working this proposal? Uh, the main motivation is to, to improve the WebAssembly integration in JavaScript. Right now, when you want to execute some JavaScript code, you have to first manually uh, get the, the URL of the model you want to, of the WebAssembly model you want to use. You have to manually fetch the model using, for example, the, 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 the fetch API. Then you have to manually compile the model to, to get something which is called a WebAssembly model. And then you can later instantiate it, linking it with all the dependencies and evaluate it. Uh, this proposal allows skipping the first steps. So instead of having to manually load a module, you can statically declare that you want some WebAssembly model to be loaded. Uh, and then you still have to manually 
uh, link it. So you get the, the source of the module, basically the bytes wrapped in a WebAssembly module object. And this is a great improvement compared to what we have today because first of all, it has bundlers a lot and like all JavaScript tools because they can statically see uh, which dependencies you're using. And also it allows much better integration with the content security policies that we have on the web uh, because it's not just a, a random fetch and then evaluated some code that we loaded from somewhere else. You can actually go through the existing security pipeline for JavaScript modules. And there are other ways in which we could integrate WebAssembly modules with, uh, with JavaScript modules, uh, such as a full integration where we just import values from WebAssembly modules as if they were JavaScript modules. Uh, there is also, uh, like, there is or there was work on going this direction, uh, but both have their advantages, like the, the manual linking that the source, uh, source phase imports proposal provide. Uh, is more flexible, and so it works with any type of assembly module, uh, even if they don't know about how dependencies are loaded on the web. Because if you would want to use the fully abstract way, uh, WebAssembly modules would have to know about URLs, would have to know about how to specify the dependencies that work in browsers, and like they, would, like they would have to specifically target the web when being compiled. And okay, so. Uh, third proposal we are exploring, uh, this is still stage one, which means like it's like actually just in the exploration stage. We are still, uh, we know what we're trying to solve. We might not have, like have, we have some ideas of what a solution might look like, but like these ideas are still like very up in the air, uh, which is the third import evaluation proposal. Uh, I, we, we saw many slides before that CommonJS allows uh, lazily requiring some modules. We just have this synchronous require function. We can use it wherever we want. And it's not really possible to do the same with TypeScript modules. Like, yes, we have dynamic import to dynamically import dependencies, but we cannot just rewrite this code from CoinJS to SM like this, replacing require with import because the import is asynchronous. So we have to await its result. Our circ function becomes asynchronous. And like, this is annoying uh, because once we have an async function, all the callers have a bit to have need to be updated to be asynchronous and like a single weight basically spread across our whole code base when we just like modify a single smooth function that is used by, by like by, by everything else. So can we somehow solve this by keeping this deferral process synchronous? If we look back uh, at the at the phases we, we saw before uh, we see that there are some asynchronous parts uh, specifically fetching a uh, fetching a model from the web. But like, we, what if we first do the synchronous part and then only defer the last steps? We only defer what we can actually do synchronously later. So this proposal exposes a model at a different stage in this pipeline, specifically after linking and loading all the dependencies. So it has like a similar syntax based on, on this keyword after the import keyword. Uh, this proposal uses defer. Uh, when, when, the, when the JavaScript engine sees this import the fire statement, it will load uh, the computed by model, it will fetch all the dependencies, so this might be asynchronous. This happens before starting to execute the code. Uh, but it doesn't evaluate it, it skips the last step. So that then when we later actually use this uh, function, when we access the export of our module, so doing like mod.py and then in space, uh, it will trigger the evaluation and complete the, the evaluation process. So this is not as, uh, on the web, we cannot defer as much as we can defer on, on with CommonJS because the web is asynchronous. But we can still like save some significant amount of computation and until when it's actually necessary. And going deeper in proposals that are like at the at the base level of how models work. Uh, we have custom model loading, which is again stage one proposal. We have an idea of what we want to solve. We don't know how the solution will look like yet. Uh, so we have, uh, we saw a couple of slides before this like back and forth between JavaScript engine, uh, some wrapper runtime in the middle that talks with a server, with a file system. And we saw this pipeline. And I didn't mark it before, but like some parts of this pipeline are defined, are implemented in the in the wrapper, specifically the parts that rely on, on I.O. And then we have some phases implementing JavaScript engine because they work the same across everything. They're fundamental to how JavaScript works. 
uh, what if we allowed hooking into what the wrapper runtime does? Uh, so that we could, for example, uh, have our own model resolution or simulate how models work in a GS by doing it on the web or vice versa. Uh, can we provide ways to customize this, like these first steps? Uh, right now, this is already possible at some extent. Uh, in browsers, we can use service works that occurs to intercept model loading. So when the browser asks to load a script, instead of talking directly with the server, there can, there can be this service person in the middle that inter intercepts the HTTP requests. Uh, it can like reply with something or load something that's from the server. Then, like in this example, it just loads the same file from the server, but then the server replies with a TypeScript file. And well, web browsers don't support TypeScript, but our service worker could like intercept this response, compile it on the fly to JavaScript, and give it back to the browser as JavaScript, pretending that like this TypeScript thing didn't happen at all. And so we can have different model types on, on the web somehow. And this is basically replacing the fetch and compile phase because the browser pre-resolves the URL and then expects us to give back a, a fetched source. Uh, Node.js has something similar. Uh, there is a flag called dash dash experimental loader uh, that, uh, allow, that sits between the Node.js model's loading process and the file system. So when Node.js wants to load a file, instead of going directly to the file system, you can go through this loader. Uh, and it allows hooking to resolution and into loading. So, yeah. so the resolve and fetch and compile phase. Th what the proposal does is to provide a way to completely abstract a weighted part uh, using the same API across all the different uh, across all the different runtimes, so that we have the the a single way to do so that works the same everywhere. Uh, the, the JavaScript implementation, the JavaScript engine, would not talk uh, when, like, would not talk with the wrap runtime anymore. Instead, it would defer to this import hook function that just the developers can define, uh, that take the specifier of the model we're importing and has to to resolve the model, to fetch the model, and then to return the model together with its context. So this is replacing all the phases that are uh, like defined by the wrap runtime. And yeah, oh, and most notably, this proposal would introduce the concept of a module. You can see this new module constructor that defines a module with some custom import behavior. And this is something that's existed in JavaScript. Uh, like we have first class functions, uh, unlike other languages, but modules are still something that sits below the language and that JavaScript code cannot really interact with. So this proposal would verify modules as first class values in the language. Uh, and from that, we can move to model expressions, which is stage two. Uh, so it's a little bit ahead of this custom model loading uh, proposal. And like, what are model expressions? So we have, like as I mentioned, functions that are first class values, and we will have models that are first class values. And we can create functions using the function constructor. I hope no one does this. And similarly, we can create models using this model constructor. Or for functions, we can also use a static syntax to more easily clear functions line. So model expressions give us something equivalent for modules, uh, which is much better than just creating code from strings because like it has, uh, like we are not evaluating strings of code that might come from somewhere else. Uh, so with potential security issues, we, we get all like better uh, integration with all the tools like linters and editors because it's just JavaScript code and not a string that could contain anything. Uh, and similarly to like functions can be called, the model expressions can be imported because they're modules. The, the motivation for module expressions is not actually just like this proposal, this other proposal introduces a module, so we need an expression form of that. Uh, I have a missing slide somewhere, uh, but model expressions allow defining multiple models in the same file. Uh, right now there was a, like one file, one module, uh, pairing in JavaScript, and uh, with module expressions, we have a module that contains an inline module, and this module 
could then be passed around. You could pass the module to another file, to another function. You could even pass the module to some other context, uh, like you might want to serialize the module and pass it to a worker, or like to anywhere else. So this proposal would allow collocating code that is logically related, regardless of where this code is actually executed. Uh, so it would like lower the to lower the barrier for creating code that can be like executing. Like the main reason is for workers, uh, because right now creating work is difficult. You, like you need a separate file, you need to to resolve this file around time. If you are providing some library, your library doesn't have a single entry point anymore. It has two entry points, and so your you need to make sure to properly resolve the other entry point. And model expressions solve this by allowing to actually collocate code and like providing a single file. And okay, then we saw that functions have the, ex have the expression form and model expressions have the expressions for modules, but functions also have a declaration form. And do modules have something similar? There is a different proposal, uh, which we decided to keep separate because it has it solved different problems and it has different challenges that we need to solve, called module declarations, that basically gives us the declaration form for modules. And I mentioned many slides ago that when migrating to these old model systems based on like wrapper functions to ESM, we don't really have an easy way to bundle anymore. Bundlers are very complex tools and because it's very difficult to bundle JavaScript modules. So once we have model declarations, bundlers could just like con start concatenating, concatenating again files in the same module. They would just need to make sure to rewrite the import specifier to refer to like the internal modules instead of external modules. And, but this very much simplifies how it's done because like tools wouldn't have to recreate, re-implement all the JavaScript model semantics. Uh, they could just declare those models and they would be executed by the browser, by the, by the JavaScript engine using the existing like model semantics that are implemented for single file models. And this is all. Yes, this is all. Uh, so we've been like we've gone through these six proposals. Uh, like uh, there are like some other discussions going on that don't really fit in our proposals, but these have like a, I think a good overview of the general space. And uh, like when are all of these proposals coming? Are all of these proposals coming? Like I mentioned that they have they are different stages. Some are already stage three, so they're approaching different shape. Uh, but like for many proposals, we're still in the exploration phase. So feedback is welcome, and like feedback might be, oh, I would really use this proposal, uh, but it needs some tweaks, or like this design is perfect as this. Uh, feedback might also be like, this is a very bad idea, you shouldn't do this at all. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully we will solve some of those problems that uh, all system already solved, and even solve problems that uh, were never solved before yet in JavaScript. And fingers crossed, uh, let's see where we go. Okay, this was the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolo. Uh, I had a question for you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, one thing you mentioned that was really interesting was the whole life cycle of import attributes and uh, you know how they've gone through the different cycles. Are there any uh, lessons for web standards authors that you want to share? Yeah, so what happened with the proposal is that uh, uh, like it was designed as attributes as uh, import assertions to uh, respect some existing guarantees that JavaScript models have. Uh, right now, you import a module and you're guaranteed to always get the same module if it's uh, like is, is if if in the f if in the same file you import the same module twice, like with the same URL, you're guaranteed to get the same module back both times. And we originally tried to like respect this as a matter of language purity. Uh, so we designed the assertions this way, but then like, and T Series Nine went ahead with this, and like, then we decided like, we realized that browsers didn't need it, and like tools have been telling us for for very long that they want something different, and like I'm happy that at the end like T Series Nine actually listened to what the community was asking for, and the proposal has been like tweaked. Uh, like the design is very similar, but like some. 
something has changed, has been tweaked to better match what the, the rest of the community needed. Uh, thank you. Uh, another thing that was really interesting is that you mentioned a number of different module systems, so to say legacy module systems uh, that have existed. Uh, for better or for worse, some of them are going to stick around forever, like common JS is not going anywhere. Uh, also, you mentioned a number of uh, shortcomings uh, for the new module system. Uh, there is a non-trivial amount of people who are upset about uh, the decision to not expand on or like sort of uh, uh, you know build on top of the existing systems. Uh, why do you feel uh, you know it's, it was necessary? Yeah. So like. All of this, that, all of this discussion, like this arena is not just a, a, a close body where like people don't listen to other people. Like uh, the people working on modules both now, like in this new modules harmony effort, and in modules for for ES15 when economic modules were originally introduced. Like there are people from like from CommonJS. There are people who work in MD. So like the result is really trying to like the the, the sum of what all the different uh, like module experiences we had in the past had to say. And like obviously if a system is designed, if a model system is designed to work in some case and you have to design a model system works in another case, that will be different. Uh, and like maybe at the time feedback was not properly listened to. Uh, like I'm not sure what happened because it was not there yet eight years ago. Uh, but like this year nine is composed of people from all the different backgrounds, like from all these different, uh, like with all these different previous experiences. So we are really like trying to consider all of what we had in the past to, to, to build what we'll have in the future. Thank you. Uh, there was a question on the chat. You mentioned uh, at least six ongoing proposals. Of course, there's also, yeah, th there's also a number of uh, additions we've already done to ECMAScript modules and, and hopefully a few more coming in later. Why is this space so complex and like why is it taking so long for us to figure out how to do modules? Because people have done modules, right? We uh, I think it's complex just because there is like a lot that can be done. Like all languages, well, m most languages have modules and most languages decided something is in scope for a module implementation, something might not be in scope. Uh, like the scope itself is very large, and it's a matter of like def deciding uh, like how you want to cut this very big scope and what you want to keep. And like this doesn't only happen for modules. Uh, like if we think about how JavaScript classes have been uh, standardized, like classes had all like the different areas that had we talked about, like uh, how should private f uh, like private methods, private private fields, put in JavaScript. Uh, in S six, we only had these like base classes with only methods. And like, so when scopes are large, it might make sense to focus on the single, on the, on the single parts to be able to properly design every single piece, uh, like as as good as possible. This doesn't always work. Uh, like, I made examples of classes. I personally think that it didn't work as well as it could with classes. But like, we we learn from the past and like. Just presenting models as a very big proposal covering everything would be too much, also because we're not even sure if we want to do everything. So like trying to to analyze the complexity of the space in like this like, with all these different like small proposals that can be motivated in their own and develop in their own is the best way we found to like to, to cut this very big scope in, in smaller pieces. Uh, one thing that you mentioned was module uh, expressions and you know, the ability to pass modules around. Uh, what about structured serialization of modules? Do you think that's something that's on the horizon? Yes, so uh, module expressions are developed with the goal of being uh, like serializable so you can pass them around. Uh, structured serialization is not, like it's technically not defined in, in, in the ECMAScript, spe ECMAScript specification. Like when you were developing a proposal like this, you, you, you must like know how you think this should be done, like uh, how structural clones should be defined for this. Uh, so yes, like I would say model expressions will uh, 
like likely only move forward if we have like a clear path ahead on how to then send them to workers because that's that's why we're working model expressions. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Uh, I just walked down. Y yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs>